So uh, we, I understand we have quite a mix of people in the audience. So um, I'm going to try and I like to try and tailor my conversation, conversation, important word I was supposed to my talk, um, with you so that you can get the most out of it. And I can give you the undergraduate course in venture capital and startups. I can give you the graduate course. And so I'll give, try and give a little bit of both. And for some of the people that I'm talking about things that other people know a lot about, well, you know, we have a time for questions later, and I hopefully I can answer them. I was uh, at Mayfield Fund. I was in venture capital for 20 years in Silicon Valley. So, and I was born and raised in Palo Alto. My dad's a Stanford graduate. Of course, we're both Berkeley graduates as well um, from the engineering school there. And uh, so, um, this is like my hometown. I used to sneak into Stanford Stadium during the big game after going to being going to school at Palo Alto High School, and since Saturday sneak into the game and stuff like that. That was when the security wasn't as good. So uh, anyway, it's gotten much better. So let me uh, kick off um, and, and try and talk about this interesting topic and see what we can do. Probably needs, there you go, okay, yeah, got, it's working. Yeah, thanks, okay. thank you. So who am I? I'm old enough to be your father. <laughs> My kids are probably older than you are, even though I hopefully don't look like it. Uh, you can see the years I graduated from Stanford, which was a long time ago. Um, I still found my way around campus, although Somebody has to tell me that Skilling was next to Durand because Durand was around when I was here. Some of the other buildings weren't, and even some of the buildings I used to go to are missing, like the Terminal Auditorium. So, um, Anyway, a Terminal Engineering Building. Um, I stayed too long at one company, which was Mayfield. Um, most people change jobs every four years. Um, I was at Mayfield Fund for 20 years, and so that's where I got my... Uh, my uh, graduate degree in venture capital. I started as an associate there, and I uh, became managing partner 20 years later. And in 2004, sort of the tail end of my uh, time at Mayfield Fund, I helped start uh, a, a venture fund called uh, GSR Ventures. Um, at the time in 2004, for those of you that can think back about what the world was like for startups and venture capital, you know, 1999, 2000 was the uh, internet bust as well as the telecom bust. And so a lot of venture capitalists were sitting around from 2000 to 2004 thinking about, how, gee, how are we going to get the returns that we used to get uh, for our limited partners in that time frame? And, and, and uh, we, we picked two areas, uh, India and China. So um, I think very fortuitous at that time, Mayfield has an India fund, and Mayfield Fund uh, started uh, uh, GSR Ventures, uh, which where they, where they backed me to do that. Um, so we were the first. Mayfield Fund was the first uh, uh, investor in GSR Ventures. And eight years later, four years later, I joined GSR Ventures, left Mayfield Fund, and decided to spend um, full time with GSR Ventures. And in 2008, started working more actively. I go to, I, I, I actually, co coincidence with that, I, as I told you, I was from this area. Mayfield Fund was based in San Jose Road, Menlo Park. I lived in Woodside. I moved to Las Vegas, and I commute. <laughs> so I commute here every other week, and I commute to China six to eight times a year. So. I, I figured, uh, why not pay lower state taxes while I'm commuting? Um, you've heard about all these other things, too. Uh, w a couple of notes, too. Um, 54 companies I've invested in over those 20 years at Mayfield Fund, nine that went public, 15 that were acquired. That was in the days when you know, acquisitions could be um, just as good as, as uh, um, IPOs. Um, my most recent one, which um, some of you in the IT industry may not know, I was chairman of the board of a public company on the NYSE called 3PAR, and most famously in 2010, Hewlett Packard and Dell fought over uh, 3PAR, and we were, you know, in a, when you're a public company being acquired by two public companies, has to, everything has to be public, and so it was a quite fun public auction. Uh, HP finally won for $2.3 billion. That division at HP, by the way, is still the most profitable division at Hewlett Packard and is the highest growth division at Hewlett Packard as Hewlett Packard has fallen on difficult times with the rest of their businesses. Okay, so, oops, sorry. Let's talk about why did Mayfield and I think about China in 2004 and I, I set the backdrop for you as well. It's, it's really quite easy um, on the left-hand side of the, of the axis here, you have the number of deals that were invested in. Now, we're talking about early stage deals. Early stage venture capital is characterized by uh, uh, companies that you invest in that don't have any revenue yet, probably don't have any product yet even, um, versus later stage deals, okay? 
So early stage deals in uh, the, from 2004 to 2010, 754 in China, um, 2,276 in the U.S. Um, and then look at the, I mean, the, the numbers on this side don't mean as much in terms of the size of the dots, although it's, uh, it's kind of impressive um, because it's by numbers, right? The real important one, which investors care about, is this number over here. Because so for $9.3 billion invested from 2004 to 2010, it turned into $155 billion of, of, of market value for companies in China. Whereas in the U.S., you had less than return of a 1x investment, right? So that's what that, that's the significant of that, okay? Um, so we had that backdrop. Clearly, we were in 2004, so we didn't have all these numbers yet, but we saw the writing on the roll. This is a little bit, unfortunately, of, a, of an eye chart, but it does show, essentially, we're counting only billion-dollar technology exit, meaning that companies that exit, meaning IPO or get acquired for more than a billion dollars, let's count those. All the smaller ones, let's not worry about for now, which is actually a lot of those. You can make a lot of money in those companies, too, but let's just focus on those. There's 49 of them since 2003 um, in China. And here's the year of IPO. Here's some names that I hope, hopefully, if you're in an East Asia class, you recognize at least, you know, Tencent and Baidu and things like that. And then, of course, their sector and then their market capitalization. So clearly, there were some companies that were doing important things already, uh, which gave us fodder for, for figuring out what we wanted to do. Um, here's a list of most valuable internet companies in, in 2005 and in, 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 in December 31st, 2012. And look at the list here, too, of um, there's no Chinese companies there. And if you look here, there's Tencent, Alibaba, and Baidu that are on the list as well. It's interesting, the number spans from 1 to 10, you know, $122 billion at, at, at Google to Expedia at, at $8 billion. Fast forward to 2012, and there's Google at $232 billion. And then the number 10 on the list, which you can't see because of the slide, um, but, you know, Baidu is there at $35 billion. So th clearly the chart has gone up. So in other words, if you invest in the internet sector as a basket of investments, you still made a lot of money, regardless of whether you're in China or the US. It's just that China has come to its fore in terms of being able to create large internet companies. So another good thing. Um, this is the graduate part of, uh, of, of the talk. Um, for those of you that watched the market, 2011 was a bubble peak in China in terms of tech investing. And since then, there's been some issues with Chinese IPOs, which I won't go into right now, but I'll mention two words, again, for graduate study. Something called transparency in terms of accounting issues, and the other thing is called ver you know, VIE, or variable accounting. A lot of issues with respect to Chinese IPOs and their market performance and their accounting techniques were made, um, um, there was quite some stellar um, revelations actually made on a couple of companies. None of them tech companies. They were all, they were all actually natural resources companies and other Chinese tech companies. But nonetheless, um, U.S. capital markets looked at these and said, "Oh, we don't really know what's going on in China." And so Chinese IPOs have had actually been challenged up until this year. And that's what this slide shows: that since 2013, actually the Chinese IPOs have started to do better again as confidence rebuilding, just like any other market cycle. You know, there's a, there's a scare, there's a downfall, and then confidence rebuilds, and then the quality companies rise to the surface, and that's what we're having here, too, as well. So some companies here, too, VIP Shops was an e-commerce company, um, NQ Mobile, Mobile, which is actually one of GSR's companies, um, which is a, a, a smartphone security company, are, are actually performing quite well post their IPO. And, and why is that important? It's important because when you take a company public and a, and a company goes public at $10 a share, let's say, the public market buyers expect that is a, it's going to continue that growth. So they would like to have that $10 stock go to $20 stock as the company grows and becomes more valuable. Well, if it does, if it does go below that, it, part public market people get upset, quite rightfully so, and then they don't invest them anymore. So that's that cycle that I was talking about. So let's go on. So this is the real chart that, for me at least, in terms of convincing my partners at Mayfield that we should be in China, why we should be there, OK? Um, so it was this, these numbers, which I'll go through in a second, and the other fact, which is I'll always remember in my sort of experience from the um, 80s until 
you know, 2004 when we were making these kinds of decisions that if, if you're in the technology business, if you weren't looking over your shoulder, and there's a very famous guy who talks about that, which is Andy Grove, if you don't, haven't read his book, it's a great one, that you're looking over your shoulder and saying, who else is doing this other than me? And in, in, at that time frame, because of these numbers, you know, my observation was India and China, okay? And our partnerships uh, this, um, um, observation was that as well. For those of you that remember Boston and Route 128, Boston and Route 128 used to be, you know, pretty, pretty competitive with Silicon Valley in terms of technology companies. You know, you had companies like Digital Equipment Corporation, Data General, Wang Corporation. These were all companies that competed with Hewlett Packard. In fact, Digital Equipment was beating everybody's butt except for IBM, and they're all East Coast, IBM included. But I'll always remember meeting with one of the founders of, 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 a, of a workstation company, which you won't remember. Um, and he said, wow, we, you know, we were building these, these workstations on the East Coast, and we never heard, thought about Intel. We never thought about Berkeley BSD, which is Berkeley Unix, and what that could do to the rest of the world. So they weren't looking over their shoulders. And what we looked at at Mayfield was, wow, look at this Internet and mobile growth. Look at what Chinese, the Chinese population and market is doing in terms of internet growth, mobile user adoption, um, and then there, you know, there's other areas like renewable energy and automotive. Automotive has been growing much more. Automotive is a growth market in China, whereas here, you know, obviously in 2008, 2009, it was not for the US. And we said, look, this trend is going to continue for a long time. This is a trend that we have to be part of. On top of that, at that time, most of the semiconductors were being made in Asia. Most of the semiconductors were being put into products that were being built in Asia and then brought to the U.S. When you have that kind of, of, uh, of, of knowledge and expertise being generated in an area, pretty soon that area begins to build on top of that and then create their own new products and things like that. So a lot of things were happening there, a lot of expertise and some core strategic areas were happening in technology. So we said if, we, if we're going to be in the tech, and this is the exact words that I used when talking about it to my partners to convince them to invest in China was, you know, if we're technology investors and, and we want to be, continue to be successful in technology, we need to be in, in China and India. So to me, that was a quite simple, simple things. I talked about in China very briefly, and this chart shows it. This shows the amount of VC funds, meaning people like GSR raising money from third parties, institutions, and taking that money and saying, we're going to invest that in tech startups. So it's that. It's one before going into a startup, OK? So this is VC fundraising. And that's a, this is a leading indicator, right? Because we raise the funds, then we take the funds and invest them in startups. As startups take five to eight years to turn it into something valuable and then you know, some type of event, right? So this is a leading indicator, right? Unfortunately, it's also a little bit of a lagging indicator because you look at 2011 here, there's a big bubble. You know, and this is the problem with markets and timing and things like that as well. 2011 happened to be a great year when everything in China was go, go, go. Mar you know, everything that you invested in looked like it was going to be successful. There were huge markets, et cetera. Um, and then obviously the money flows in. Money has a very fast velocity, right? <laughs> money flows into areas where there's returns. And if you know your macroeconomics, what happens there, right? So this is what happened in 2011. Um, China went through some of these issues as I mentioned before. Um, it's now, I think, stabilized now. China is sort of stabilized in terms of the, the, the companies. You know, expectations are kind of meeting um, re, uh, reality in terms of what's happening. And so, so things are returning back to normal. So 2012 actually is a more normal level. And actually, for venture capitalists, we like this better. Because, you know, if there's just, if everybody's making money, no matter where you put it, you know, we have no value added, right? But um, we know over the long term that that can't be true. And in fact, um, we like to have these types of levels in terms of the investments. If you look at this number in, in 2012, what does that say, $9 billion? Um, that's a little more sustainable level. People in our business, if you're a venture capitalist looking at your economics and you're looking at your, your world, you're saying, what's the amount of dollars that this startup world or the startup environment can handle before it gets overdone, right? How many you know, times can you invest in multiple Facebooks and get a return before, you know, no one's successful, right? So that dilution happens. So that's always a, a level that we, that we seek. Um, this is just, I'll skip over this. This is fundraising by type. 
there is a, uh, in China, and originally how GSR started, is we raised dollar denominated funds in order to invest in Chinese companies. In China, there are limitations on foreign currency conversion, and so this is the mechanism that we invested in. What's becoming a trend has, bec has sort of started about three to four years ago is investing in RMB, which is the local currency denominated funds. And so you raise RMB funds to invest in Chinese companies in RMB. There's, um, it's, it's too complex to go into right now, um, but there is this extra world that exists between dollar or foreign currency denominated funds and RMB de denominated funds that you don't have here in the US because there's you know, free, free currency translation and stuff like that. There's no restrictions, except for the Patriot Act. Um, uh, this is a this is another uh, um, interesting trade. Will, can, will these be posted on the on the yeah, course website if, as well? If the, yes, yeah. We'd so like some of these I decided those. to put in just so that you guys could have them as reference as well. Because if you ever want to do any more research or look at them, these are numbers from quoted sources that you can see below. And uh, anything you ask about in terms of you know how much money is flowing into venture capital in China, how much money is being invested in what industries, you know these kinds of of numbers uh, are here for you. But let's get on to the more fun stuff. GSR Ventures, and this is a, a little bit of a sales pitch, but I'll go through it r really quickly. Let's talk about venture capital just as an asset class and as a practice, OK? Um, uh, Mayfield Fund was founded in 1968 by a gentleman by the name of Tommy Davis. He started in venture capital in 1963. And for those of you that remember a company called Watkins Johnson, which was also a Stanford spin out like Hewlett and Packard was, Stanford spin out. It was, you know, Stanford students with the support of Frederick Terman <laughs> starting a company at Stanford Industrial Park. It, it was one of those. So Tommy Davis was an investor. That was his, one of his first investments was in 1963. And he, he had a firm uh, with a gentleman by the name of Arthur Rock, who's legendary in this area. He most famously invested in Intel. Um, and also they invested in Xerox Scientific Data Systems, which became Xerox, which became Xerox Park. So that was their early days of investing in 1963. In 1968, Tommy started, Tommy Davis started Mayfield Fund, uh, which is where, where I was. So by the time I started in 1988, Mayfield Fund was already 20 years old, okay? The, the characterization of uh, venture capital sort of up until 2000 was, it was dominated by um, a, a, a class of very top tier VC funds. And over and over again, we continued, we, Mayfield being one of them, continued to, to, to outperform the group, and there was a very, a very select group. 2000 kind of changed that. The internet bubble, as well as other things, uh, sort of changed that. And I, I would say that the success across venture funds became much more broad. Now, that took you know, some 40 years, OK? In China, which you know, a fund cycle is maybe a third of what the US um, typically is, has accelerated that and taken that 40-year history and compressed it in a much shorter time frame. And, and there's a good reason. Would you, would you uh, explain what you mean by fund cycle? Oh, fund cycle, sorry. A fund, when you raise a fund, like let's say we raise $100 million. OK, we're all going to go out and we're going to go to limited partners. We're going to raise $100 million to invest in startups. That $100 million gets invested over a certain amount of time. And that's what I would call a fund cycle. Typically, that number is four years. Okay. And then after we invest all that, we go to the partners again and say, hey, look what we did. Give us another $100 million. We'll take another four years to do that. I mean, there's a lot of details in between, of course. But that's roughly how it goes. In China, of course, China has the opportunity in all markets, whether they're um, electronic markets, or whether they're VC funds, that it has the past experience of other places to look at. And so everything's, everybody knows a story, right? That's sort of what it could become. And so the cycles are much quicker. And I'd say in, ge in, in general in China, all markets, again, happen that way very quickly. OK? Um, we'll talk more. This last one talks about sort of China versus the US in terms of the differences. I have a slide specifically about that, so I'll expand on that more. OK? So we're focused on a very specific, there's many uh, types of venture capital. I already, I already talked about early stage uh, venture capital. So GSR and Mayfield Fund, where I was, my, all my experience is in early stage venture capital, meaning it's typically before you have a product or typically, and certainly before you have revenue, OK? You have a bunch of people. They have a, a business plan. They have a PowerPoint presentation. 
and they want to raise money to do something, and, and we, we choose to do that or not. Um, we have 50 active portfolio companies, meaning that we've invested in them. Their, their, their outcome is yet to be determined. That's what I mean is by active. Um, um, since 2004, and this may look like a small number, and it, we've had two I IPOs and one merger and acquisition, meaning one company was acquired. So NetChin is the, number, the company that went public. Um, that's a, in the smartphone business. Um, we have one uh, that went public actually on the Shanghai Stock Exchange, which we wasn't, weren't expecting. It's a, it's a Bloomberg type company called, called Dodzue. And then we had a company that was acquired by, uh, majority acquired by Baidu. And it's a, for those of you who know the Kayak, Chinar is the uh, Chinese version of Kayak. Very simple, vertical search. Okay? Very successful company. We still have an ownership of the company. Uh, one of the founding partners of, of uh, GSR Ventures, Richard Lim, is still on the board. And um, it's, a, it's, it's a great company, doing very, very well. Okay? So, when you're in, when you're in early stage venture capital, there's many strategies, of course. And the strategies that we have chosen to invest in, which is my experience as well in Mayfield, is to invest in early stage companies that can be huge companies. So we're not looking if you, OK, for those of you that are baseball fans, there's batting average and there's slugging percentage, right? So read Moneyball, um, great book. Uh, batting average is great, you know? Uh, you bat 400. Slugging percentage is how many home runs and multiple base hits that you have, right? And so in our t form of venture capital, and it just happens to be one form, we only want to invest in companies that can be billion dollar outcomes. You don't always get there, but we always want to invest in companies that have potential for large outcomes. So what that means is, you know, risk reward. That means we have a lot of companies that don't make it. We have a lot, of, but, but the few companies, there's a very famous saying in venture capital. It says you can lose your money once. Okay, it was actually Reed Dennis. He said, you can lose a million dollars once, but you can make it back many times. And what do you mean by that? If I've invested a million dollars in a mobile game company, if it goes bust and I lose all that, I lose that million dollars. However, if that game company turns into Zynga, I can easily make back $10 million off of that million dollars. So that's what that term means. Very, very, Reed Dennis is one of the, f I want to call him grandfather, I probably hate that, but um, he, ha he is a grandfather. So, I mean, he's one of the grandfathers of venture capital and, and very famous saying. He had another very famous saying too, is his cash is king. I mean, that was Reed Dennis as well too. So anyway, um, that's what we're looking at. And the sectors we invest in, internet, software, wireless, green technology, um, systems and components. Okay, um, we have carried the strategy consistently over our eight years of existence. We have a very stable team. It's the same same team, and even at you know, um, even at eight years old, we're still a very young firm. You know, by young I mean that even though we've raised four funds with a billion dollars under management, there's still many cycles this team as a group has to experience. Right. You know, spend 20 years in venture capital and maybe you get, you know, two or four cycles if you're lucky. And the more cycles you have, just like the turns on a semiconductor or how many times, how many revs on a, on a software version you have, the more turns you have, it gets better every time, right? So it's tough to be good on just one turn. Okay, what does it take to succeed as a venture capitalist? So, so uh, I think most of you guys want to be entrepreneurs. But the postgraduate of entrepreneurs is being a venture capitalist. And for those of you that aspire to that, which when I was sitting in your seats, I did. You know, I was, I, I, my vision was to become a venture capitalist after I became a successful startup entrepreneur. This is what, I mean, it's actually quite simple. You have to be good at investing and make money if you're limited partners. That's, that's all this says. One of the problems, however, is this darn feedback cycle. We talked about the fund cycle being four years. You know, you could be a venture capitalist for five years and you have no idea if you're any good at it or not because the companies you've invested in at an early stage, you have no idea how they're going to turn out. You could have one that, that does return money and you, you could, that could be luck. But how can you be sure that you can do that over and over again? So this, is the, the, this long feedback cycle is one of the issues about being a venture capitalist, which makes it hard. Everybody that I, you know, I used to meet that 
you know, was in your shoes or other shoes that wanted to be a venture capitalist, they go, wow, I want to be a venture capitalist. It looks so easy. You know, you guys make so much money and blah, blah, blah. Everybody, every one of those that actually made it in venture capital, when I speak to them now, they go, wow, you didn't tell me it was this hard. <laughs> because you don't see, everybody sees the successes, you don't see all the failures. Okay. What does it take to succeed as an entrepreneur? Well, to me, the number one is vision. And, and, and the vision is, to me, simply put is, this is what the world will be like after me. After I do this, this is what the world will look like. Okay. Now, this is a big vision, too. This is the billion dollar type company, right? Because this is not like, well, I'm going to make it easier to get into your car. I'm not going to make it easier to do this. This is about how the world is going to look differently after me. Okay. It takes balance, extremely difficult. This is something that nobody ever gets right. And if you're any good at yourself, at, at bettering yourself, you work every day to try to do, which is how do I find the balance? The balance is what's my strength of conviction? That's what drives you to do something that says, this is the way it's going to be, darn it. And I have a vision, darn it, right? Number one. Versus, wow, I better listen to some people that have some opinions that count. And some of those opinions are terrible. And some of those opinions are very good. And you've got to mix those two and find that balance. So that, this, is a, this to me is extremely hard too, but necessary criteria. Um, there are a few people that damn their torpedoes. I don't care about anybody's opinions. And they are right. But it's usually, they're usually listening somehow, whether it's their gut or whether it's their closest advisor or whether it's their wife or whomever it is, their board of directors, hopefully. <laughs> so the other thing too is, uh, this is a, I, I, I kind of, you know, everybody's heard of the book, Failure's Not an Option, right? So definitely, and this is an old Chinese saying too, failure is an opportunity, right? And no fear of failure. This is a very societal thing. Before China, and, and I, I remember in the, in the 90s, I used to get invited to countries and say, how can we have Silicon Valley? What do we need to develop Silicon Valley? What kind of infrastructure do we need to put in place? And, you know, I'd... I'd tell some of them, like I remember going to Hong Kong and speaking at the China Club, and they said, what can we do to get that? And, and the answer to me was, you know, societally, you, you, you know, some societies have this issue about failure, right? Whether you call it, why do you call it loss of face or failure or whatever, some places, and by the way, this happened to be the East Coast too for a while in the U.S. I tried to recruit a friend of mine, long-term friend of mine, who's, who's a vice president of Digital Equipment Corporation to come, come to the come to the valley to take a job where I thought he could do a great job. And he goes, oh, my neighbors would never, never look me in the face, right, if I said I was lef leaving digital equipment to go work at a startup and so I think I'm crazy, right? So, so cultural things, not just, you know, U.S. versus China, things like that, made a big difference. And many cultures are like this where there's, there's you know, the failure is seen as a black one. I think in China and other countries like Israel, there is this issue about, you know, trying one's best is, is, is good enough. I mean, not all Chinese culture is this way. I'm not, certainly no expert on it, but certainly the people that I hang around with in China don't care about failure. I mean, not, of course they care about failure, but they, they don't care what long term. They say, I can do it again. I can do something again. Okay, so this failure not an option thing too is, that's the, here with this balance, right? If failure is not an option, sometimes it's better to go home and start over again than it is to just bowl through something. And I can't tell you where that point is, but you know, the failure not, is not an option thing is great if you're on you know, Apollo 13 and you have no, literally no other options, right? But if you're doing other things, sometimes it's better to, to, to do that, to, cha to change. Um, resourcefulness, good network of people. I think these are all things you know. And then, of course, money. We'll talk more about that, of course. What does money mean? So now we're getting to the section about what's sort of different Sort of lessons for me, 20 years in Silicon Valley, eight years in China, what are some differences? And these are the differences that I found about raising venture <laughs> capital. So um, uh, basically none, right? Good people, great value proposition, great market. Um, you got to be able to communicate. No idea is worthwhile if you can't communicate it to someone else. And then you, of course, have to email or LinkedIn me in order to get funded. 
um, or you get it from friends and family or you find other, other VCs. So let's talk about, this is sort of fun, but it's true. I, I stand by this, even though it's a little tongue in cheek, I stand by this. So let's, let's dig a little deeper. What does this mean? So what's different in China? Number one, I had a little bit of issue with in, in terms of as I wrote it, because I, I believe it's true, but it's also, I think, I, I couldn't decide whether it was a major factor or as a result of something else. But, but clearly that has, this has to do with the fact that you know, the people networks there are, are not as large and harder to get in, con in contact with. Um, he, if you're in Silicon Valley, I mean, you go to downtown Palo Alto at Starbucks and you can find someone to figure out how to do something about a startup, right? Or you can go to your next door neighbor, you go to your classmate, or you go to your dorm mate or someone, there's information all over the place. Now clearly with the internet, that, a lot of that is, is, is gone as well and in fact, in China, that's how a lot of entrepreneurs and people get their information about how to do things. And that's you know, one of the wonderful things about the internet, right? But the other issue is that even if you, f you still need people, you can find and read as much as you can, but at some point in time, you want to be able to talk to someone who's done it before. And that's what's missing in China. Now, there is a Starbucks in China that's like that. For those of you, that, that's, it's almost like the downtown University Avenue Starbucks, right? It's in Zhongguanchun, it's, it's where Tsinghua University is, and there's electronics and sort of high-tech park all around Tsinghua University. And there's a Starbucks in one of these uh, markets. For those of you from Japan, it, when I used to live there's Akihabara. Remember Akihabara? I think it's still sort of the same way I remember it. But there in, in Zhongguanchun, there's still an area like that. And that Starbucks, I mean, I can sit in that Starbucks and I can run into people that are you know, from the valley and all over the place. It's kind of fun, actually. Um, so um, again, I, this is related to what I was just saying as a point, point number one. Um, it's, it, it is incredibly hard to find good CEOs, chief financial officers, engineering managers. You know, you find some specific engineering disciplines, it's hard to find people in China. They're there, but they're hard to find. And if they are there, they're extremely competitive. If, I mean, if I didn't care where I lived and I was a CFO and I had experience bringing you know, you know, being a CFO at startups or taking companies public, I can make twice as much money in China as I could here right now because it's just that hard as a talent to find. There's not that many people here with Sarbanes-Oxley, I mean, in China with Sarbanes-Oxley experience or, or with uh, um, public uh, accounting practices and things like that. I mean, those are just hard, hard to find people. And in fact, much ha like happened during the bubble here, there's people that jump around from successful company to successful company and are doing quite well for themselves. Um, in key technical areas, like if you're experienced in mobile at all, mobile advertising or mobile e-commerce, those people are in very high demand in China right now, hard, hard to find. Um, the tribal knowledge, uh, do people mean, know what I mean when I mean tri the tribal knowledge, I'm trying to say sort of like the generally accepted knowledge that sort of people around you sort of know. Palo Alto is a, you know, or Silicon Valley in general is kind of a, just a weird different place, right? Again, if you, want, if, if you went down to, I mean, I remember speaking at my kids' uh, economics class in high school, at Gunn High School, which is on Foothill Road in Rasadero in Palo Alto, and some kid in the audience asked me about um, preferred stock versus common stock. It blew my mind. I, I just couldn't believe that. I don't think there's any place in the world, you know, it has to do, obviously do with the environment we're in here that, that someone did that. I think that person was very smart, but, you know, that specific knowledge. Um, <laughs> there in, in certain areas in China, it's getting to be that way as well. But uh, um, the tribal knowledge is sort of what's around and where you can get that. Here, you can get that knowledge by talking to a neighbor, classmate, or it's just easy to find, right? And in China, it's still not. There are lots of groups that meet, entrepreneurs that meet and things like that. And it's pretty cool because those are getting uh, uh, pretty active as well. And in fact, Stanford and alumni associations, Berkeley and Stanford and alumni associations are actually very strong rallying points for people to get together and talking about these things too. So the tribal knowledge is increasing. Um, support infrastructure is hard. You know, I mean, here, landlords understand if you can't pay them, you want to give them some stock options along with the rent, they're willing to rent to you even though your company has no history whatsoever. You know, places in China, I mean, you can go to the government, they'll understand that, but no one else will, right? So just little things like that. You know, I need a CAD designer. I need to do some industrial design. I mean, I can just go to any place around here and find an industrial design shop or consultant, and they'll do that for me, right? China, it's a little harder to do that, okay? 
There's a smaller number of experienced people like me in China as well, too. A lot of people in China, uh, VCs themselves, don't come from operating backgrounds and, and aren't necessarily, um, and think f f from the mind of an investor versus the mind of a venture capitalist. And venture capitalists are investors, but they're more operating people and technology people than they are pure investors, okay? He needs a both, of course. Um, on the plus side, I think it's, well, first of all, it is, you know, you can prove it empirically, it's cheaper to do business in China. But the other thing, I think it's easier to do business in China. And it has to do with the environment, with the government, and with the general population. I think, the, it, you know, Silicon Valley prior to the bubble burst was, wow, I'll try it, anything can work, let's see. Whereas today, it's more like, oh, what's going to happen on the downside? How can I protect myself from something failing? Whereas in China, it's like, wow, let's try that. Let's see if it works. Um, I think people are more, ex I mean, just the general population, like for example, smartphones, innovations in smartphones, innovations in personal technology, people are much more willing to take chances on it. Whereas I think in the US, it's not quite that as well either. And part of it is because the general population is increasing in its exposure to things that are more than just basic. And so they're open to all kinds of things like that. It's like a kid with a new toy. So disposable income is a new toy. Entertainment and being able to have income to spend on entertainment, to buy a car, to buy a smartphone, to buy the next generation smartphone, to try something else, I mean, a new tablet. I mean, that's all there, OK? So what else is different in China? So what are the implications of some of the things we're talking about as well? And here's, the, I think, for those of you that are, that are already China watchers, my number one thing that's different about Silicon Valley versus China right now and the basic challenge for China. And so that's cha changing and adding to the management teams. We already talked about the shortage of management talent in China, OK? But in Silicon Valley, it's change it if it isn't working, right? It, which includes CEO, which includes VP of engineering, which includes you know, up and down the ranks. You find someone that works it. It, it is a very Darwinian system here, right? You either make it work or you don't, or you hire someone else if the, you're not going to be able to do it. In China, it's not quite that easy, right? Whether it's because of founders, whether it's because of allegiances of teams, or whether it's just because of lack of talent, whether it's cultural, there's a lot of those things. And so in, in China, I think this is going to be the number one thing. Is, um, I, I, I'm a big believer in this thing is change is good, change is your friend. I also believe is that, you know, this is an old sports saying, if something you're doing isn't working, you change it. It's better than doing the same thing over and over again, right? And so in China, I think from the management side, um, people have to get comfortable with that. It's, a, it's um, I think, and again, I'm not a Chinese cultural expert, but just my observation is that it comes from the fact that a lot of successful ch uh, Chinese companies were, were either government or patriarchal, right? Patriarchal meaning that there was a family business and it was run like a family with the, with the patriarch on down, right? And so how can you replace that, right? The owner and the CEO and the chairman are all the same people, right? Well, this is different. Western style businesses, st startup style businesses are ownership and leadership are separated leadership, and this is the difference between U.S. traditional business and venture capital too, is that U.S. leadership has a large stake in the ownership of the company, um, but does not own all the company enough to control it as well. So that check and balance is, a ver I think, is very real. You can theorize it about it all day. You know, people at the business school can write, write all kinds of things about executive compensation and motivation and things like that. In real life, this is how I've seen it played out, and that's my personal opinion. I think it's a key ingredient of success, what I just described about Silicon Valley, OK? Um, so the bottom line, when I talk to entrepreneurs that are in this position, and we've only had one situation, maybe a couple, where we've um, successfully changed leadership, um, is do you want to be successful, or do you want to protect your ego? And that's what it comes down to at the end of the day, right? Even someone as revered as Steve Jobs failed his first time around as CEO of Apple. And I would say fail. He grew a lot. 
He did a lot of amazing things, and not taking anything away from him. But, and then he could come back to Apple and do amazing things, absolutely unbelievable things, right? So different people at different phases of their lives are good at different things. And very few people last from the very beginning in the garage all the way up to a $100 billion company or even a billion dollar company, okay? So on the other things about China that are different, liquidity events. M&A is a very common here. It started in the 90s. Before the 90s in Silicon Valley, technology M&As were not uh, as apparent. Um, in China, it's a very new thing. There's uh, one of our companies I, I told you about, Chinaro, got bought um, by Baidu. That was a very new thing in the internet space. I mean, there's a lot of $5 million and $10 million acquisitions, but this was a $300 million acquisition by Baidu. There was a merger. One of uh, the founding partners of, of GSR is a chairman and founder of a company called Asia Info. Asia Info did a multi-billion dollar merger with, with uh, Linkage. And that is a, I mean, that was unusual too. So those things are still new. You know, obviously in the Silicon Valley over the last 20 years, since the 90s, we've had many, many of those things that have been successful. Um, capital market strategy difference. Um, the China factor I talked about, which is the transparency in VIE. I won't go into those right now unless there's questions about that later on. Um, so how you approach an IPO in China is, is just a little bit different as well. We already talked about the first one. Um, in China, because it's easier to get started and actually do more with less, a lot of the early stage startups, and I'm going to contradict myself a little bit, actually have product or customers already, even though they've gotten no institutional funding. It's because you can do uh, a lot, especially the types of business. Obviously, doing a mobile game company or doing an internet company is, is, takes a lot less than if you're starting a semiconductor company or an enterprise software company or a networking company. Um, as a result, we have, we have more time to, to choose deals because there's just fewer VCs there. Um, we have found the relationships with the central and provincial governments to be very, very positive. I mean, unbelievably positive. I mean, the Chinese government lays it out so well about, okay, here's our 10 objectives that we're going to do for the, for the next, uh, next five-year plan. And if you follow those, I mean, it's, it's not like changing administrations and things like that where things can change overnight, right? So it's very, it's very reliable. And also, they're well thought out as well. I mean, they're very common sense strategic areas. Um, China has taken a chapter out of how Japan developed itself, how Korea developed itself, how Taiwan developed itself, how the U.S. developed itself, and has combined all those things. So there's no, it's no, no surprise that there are science parks here, right? Everybody has copied the Stanford Industrial Park model, right? It's a very successful model, all the way from uh, Shinchu in, in, uh, in Taiwan to, you know, uh, Tsinghua and, and uh, Zhongguozhun in, in, in Beijing. So. Um, so anyway, so that's, it's, 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 it's really, really good. Um, translating experience from Silicon Valley to China takes experience. Um, clearly, you just, I mean, I would say for the initial five years of our company, um, of, of GSR Ventures, when we invested in companies, it was, you know, like you saw, Chinar was sort of the Chinese version of Kayak. We could do that in many different things. We had to translate it, but we could do that with many different things. So we've learned a lot about what translation you have to make. Kayak and Chinar are not exactly the same company. It's sort of the same spirit and the same ideas, but things have to be different and, and in, a, in a Chinese way. And that's, that's our experience. That's what, we've, that's what we've learned over the, over the eight years. So, so, you know, so we're not talking about language translation. We're talking about business model translation, and, and um, it works really well. There are also fewer and fewer things, right, as you go over time, because as the Chinese entrepreneurs have caught up with the, there's less lag between when innovation gets done here in the internet space or e-commerce space or the coupon space. And then when it gets translated in China, it gets copied much faster. Um, there are other markets where that, that experience is not there. Um, e-commerce has been a little bit slower, but happening, but different in China. You know, there's, there's many other areas where there's some fascinating things that are happening in terms of differences. Um, so uh, a couple examples, gaming. There's no, con there's basically, I mean, console games here, of course, are a mainstay of gaming in, in, in the U.S. In China, there's no gaming consoles. Everything is PC or online or mobile, okay? Um, the, uh, um, in China, there are actually, and this is an area where the, the knowledge of business models can go the other way. The monetization for gaming in China is much more well-developed than in the U.S. I mean, Tencent 
is a company, you know, the largest internet company on there, except, yeah, for, um, in terms of Chinese internet company, has made its initial money completely on monetization, um, on things like virtual goods and things like that. Un unbelievable, fantastic company. And there, I, they have a development center in, in, in Silicon Valley and Palo Alto now. On the mobile side, mobile, um, I think this is an area where China is, is, is on par or leading compared to the US. Um, mobile gaming, I mean, due to the fact that there's so many mobile phones and very rapid mobile adoption in China, and plus the infrastructure in terms of LTE and, and 4G networks and things like that happen very quickly in China. Um, those, uh, um, there's exploding growth there, so the, the interface between internet and mobile is, uh, is incredible. Um, there are some things though too. China Mobile has, I don't know what the number is, like 80% market share, right? So imagine one of the carriers in the US having 80% market share, it changes them things a little bit. Um, distribution and payment, there isn't, I mean, the, the iTunes does not dominate in China the way, same way it is here. Android's a very effective platform in China. Monetization is an issue. So, um, so there's some issues there about how you actually monetize and things like that. I'm going very slow. We've got to go fast. I'm behind. Okay, there's smartphones. We talked about that. iOS revenue growth. Uh, freemium is the model. You guys know the difference between freemium and premium models on gaming. Freemium is definitely the way to go. Um, I won't go into this too. This, is, this has to do with the fact that, that applications and who controls it. I mean, there is no Apple Store. There is no Google Play Store there that is dominant. It's all fragmented in China right now. And believe it or not, too, China Mobile as a dominant carrier there really doesn't provide much direction either too. So that app, whole app universe is, is kind of strange in China right now. The successful companies are making money off of iTunes stores for Chinese, you know, Chinese applications, and there are some, you know, successful uh, developers on the uh, on the on the Android world, but it's not consolidated at all. It's more fragmented. Um, one market that doesn't exist is that's been existence and very successful for venture capital and startups in in Silicon Valley is enterprise uh, and software infrastructure. Um, it's just been non-existent in China. Yeah, for lots of reasons that we can go into. Clean tech is, is huge in China. As Right now, it, we're sort of in a downside in the U.S. in terms of uh, material science and clean tech investing. In China, it's huge. The government is supporting it. It's one of the one of the plans. Electric vehicles, for example, batteries, that whole area is, is a huge area of support. LEDs, where GSR happens to be large investors. We're investors in electric vehicles, batteries, and, and LEDs. Um, you know, all due to government direction and support and initiatives and um, opportunity. Um, in the semiconductor side, I mean, starting a semiconductor here, a company in Silicon Valley is just tough. In China, it's, it's still possible in selective areas. We have some very successful semiconductor companies, actually. Oops, that's it. So, sorry, I had to rush at the end a little bit, though, but I'm running out of, I ran out of time here and wanted to make sure that uh, I left time for questions. Sorry. Yeah, that's name? great. Okay, We've still got some time for questions. <laughs> So let me ask the first one. Uh, <laughs> did you see the reduction in, in VC funding in 2012 as a correction? Is it going to move back up now, or is this something related to the slowdown in the Chinese economy? No, no. So f first of all, I think you know. Again, there's lots of different beliefs. The um, everything moves in cycles, and I believe that 2012 will be sort of the bottom of the U curve, meaning it's going to be flat for a while and, and maybe, you know, could go up. But it's, it's, it's not dropping anymore. Things are, things are in pretty good shape in China. Okay, good. Let's move on. Go ahead. Cycles are faster in China. And it would seem like uh, for venture capital, it's a certain type of investing. It would seem that it would be the same. If you short it too much, you're basically flipping. And if it's too long, then it's not VC investment. So why would it be shorter? Or do you mean that they're overlapping more? Or what, what do you mean exactly? So um, it's, a, it's a great question. Um, the, the time it takes from investing to a company to the time it's mature and maybe successful is actually looking about the same. I mean, the U.S. now, if, for U.S. venture capital portfolio companies, it's about eight years, which is actually a long time. For our Chinese companies, if you look at our short history at GSR, it's six to eight years as well. You know? And so from that perspective, it's the same. What I mean by shortening cycle, I think more about market and technology cycles, and maybe even more market cycles, okay? 
So for example, um, when Groupon, remember those days when Groupon was hot and the next big thing, right? So that cycle actually happened fairly fast here in the US, meaning that there was a big hype. It got big very, I mean, Groupon got big in revenues very, very fast, and then it quickly dropped off and flattened and became out of favor, right? Well, in China, there were probably 500 Groupon knockoffs. And they went through that same cycle that Groupon went through um, with only maybe a six month to a one year lag in terms of time. So that's, that's what I meant. So, so there's a couple of different themes sort of playing there. Um, and now the, 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 the Groupon sort of uh, fad in China is still there and probably will be successful, not as, as big as we thought it would be, but, um, but it's morphing, you know, and it's morphing very fast. I mean, 500 startups like that too. Most of those were, were junk, right? That, you know, weren't that good, but. So is the gap between domestic VC and, and foreign VC shrinking? Is domestic VC really becoming more like we would know VC in Silicon Valley? Yeah, yeah, so the, the, I would claim that most of the foreign VCs are still a dominant form in, in China, in, in certain industries, like the same industries we would consider mm -hmm. here. I mean, there are Chinese VCs in certain other industries that U.S.-based or originated VCs don't participate in and stuff like that. But in general, I think the, the, the U.S. VCs are still... Okay, I saw one over there. So, uh, you mentioned that uh, engineering talent over here is definitely way more, there's way more here than China. However, China obviously has a huge market. So what advice would you give to startups that are starting here but targeting the Chinese consumer market? So I, I think that, uh, uh, by the way, I don't have to repeat the questions, are there? That's all right, they, they outside, should okay. be picking them up. So, um, I, 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 so first of all, I, I do believe that we will mature into a world where, um, you know, uh, talent on both sides of the world will be the same. We have a lot of companies that actually have feet in both places, meaning development organizations in one place or the other, just like, you know, it was popular to have Silicon Valley companies have an Indian development arm. Um, many of our companies are thinking globally now um, first. I mean, ideally, it would be great to have more talent in China, but, you know, people are, uh, are, are, uh, um, are, are developing in both places. So there is, a, there is a possibility of creating a company here for targeting Chinese, Chinese markets. So how do you bootstrap the same way that you would bootstrap any other company? I mean, G we have GSR has offices here and in Beijing. Now, initially, it's mostly because we're funneling talent that was coming from, you know, U.S. companies and universities going back to China. That's why we have an office here. But more and more, it's because we think that there can be, you know, talent in both places. It's always hard, though, to have, I don't care where you in the world you are, it's not just a China-US thing, though. It's always hard to develop for a market when you're actually not in that market, you know? I mean, you, you do have to be careful of that. Good. Go ahead, Ed. Uh, through this seminar, Richard has taught us a uh, cultural <coughs> difference about entrepreneurs in Asia, that Asian entrepreneurs oftentimes prefer to start a business that they can um, pass on to their kids. Their kids will inherit it. So how do you sort of separate the folks that are have traditional thinking culturally uh, versus the more Silicon Valley type entrepreneur. So wants and exits. So, so like Richard, I mean, I, I you know, I, I lived in Japan as well as um, you know for the first part of my early tech career. You know, obviously a lot of the business was ja Japanese centric, and I, I'd say that was more prevalent in, in Japan and in Hong Kong. In in China, because of the, the background, I mean, it certainly it has that culturally, but it's it's it's. It's, it's, it, and it's true in some industries, but in the industries that we practice in, it's less true because they're not historical businesses, right? I mean, if you were in a real estate business or in a manufacturing business doing textile manufacturing or something like that, maybe you have more of those. Um, so Taiwan and Hong Kong are characterized by those. When, when I mentioned patriarchal type of sort of management experience, th that's what I was referring to, though. I mean, that was that sort of cultural artifact. Yeah, can but I China, drill down on yeah, that a yeah, little bit? Yeah. So you're talking about the ability to change management or add management to a Chinese company. And this is something that the venture capitalists here have been very effective at to right. aim for maximum growth, right? Right. Uh, is that because the ownership shares of stock are typically lower for VCs in China so that the original owner-founder has more stock or 
Why is it that the dynamics don't allow change as much? Uh, there? That's a, it's, it's a, a very it's, fluid it's a, it's, labor market. It's a very, it's a very good question. I, I, I think some of what you said is true, and but it's you know my experience to date is that it, it sort of depends. I mean, do the founders have more shares than than the? Yeah, I, I yeah. don't think the answer is no. I mean, but I'd have to look at okay. it statistically to really firmly answer that. In my do you my have a way of no. looking at a at a group ahead of time and seeing uh, this group is not going to listen to feedback? Uh, we we like to think so, <laughs> 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 but you discover more as the relationship goes on. But it's it's just hard. I mean, I mean, it's not hard easy here either. It's just uh, um, how do you, know, it's, how, it's, do you it's, how do you do what is due diligence in China? For due diligence is the same as is here. I okay. mean, I mean, okay. it, there's no difference in due diligence. I mean, we still talk to the same kind of networks of technical experts that yeah. you would talk yeah. to to sort of check out the technology. You talk to markets, you talk to customers, and then you just interview the people and get a feeling for the for the people themselves. I mean. Ideally, if they were, again, I mean, we can do a little bit of personal due diligence here easier because yeah. usually someone else knows that other person. In China, it's, some of that is happening, but so, some of it is less, too. So it's, it's, it, it's, it's hard. But that's true of any market that you're sure. going to for the first time, not just in, in China. Yeah. The, 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 it's a, it is a fascinating issue to me, just personally, yeah. about this issue of control and changing management and things like that. It has happened, you know, um, um, in, in China. We have done it. Yeah. Um, and you know, but it's it's hard, and also to its teams. There are some teams that are just absolutely loyal to their their managers that they have there, and then yeah. and then so if you change that manager, it's like that oh my god, it what is, yeah, what's it going to do? Yeah. Uh, okay. While well, I'm still asking, have you seen a shift over the last eight years in terms of new areas of opportunity? You know, labor costs are higher now, so a lot of the old labor cost difference is not going to be an advantage. Yeah, so I mean that's another point. I don't think things that, so our business tended not to be based on lower cost labor. Mm -hmm. Lower cost manufacturing, yes, which in some cases has to do with cost of capital. Okay. Yeah. But not just pure labor cost. It's usually for the investments that we've made is lower cost of capital and lower manufacturing costs. And so there are some areas we invest in where we do count on the fact that either scale or lower cost of capital means lower manufacturing costs. Okay, couple. I saw your hand first. How do you deal with uh, intellectual property issues, uh, both in terms of how you make decisions in China and uh, how you see that changing uh, as we're moving forward? So a couple of things. I was never a big IP person even when I was in Silicon Valley. I mean, you know, entrepreneurs were usually more scared of people stealing their ideas than I was because it's usually if you're investing in a company, it's about know-how, right? As you, you always hear at IP, there's 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 the intellectual property and the and the and the copyright protection, and there's the know-how, right? Know-how is a big portion. I mean, the software included as well. There are some areas, of course, where you cloned something. I mean, if I shouldn't, I don't know if I should say this, might be politically incorrect. But I mean, if you're like Huawei in you know 10 years ago, and you were literally c copying firmware out of Cisco's routers, you know, I mean. Uh, both sides say that doesn't happen. That didn't happen, right? But anyway, so um, <laughs> that's why I said it's politically incorrect. But anyway, you know that's that's one thing. I don't think that level of of copying is is a problem in China anymore because China has evolved not only in the WTO process but also now China has things to protect. Every time you have things to protect, you start protecting other people's things. And it happened in Japan. It happened in Taiwan you know, happened in the U.S. Can I drill down on that just a minute, just by mentioning that the average cost of litigating an intellectual property case is somewhere around three to six million dollars, and most startup companies can't afford it here or anywhere else, right? Yeah. 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 I saw another hand. Go ahead. Um, yep, you were next. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that GSR has a great relationship, relationship with the provincial government. Um, so I've actually heard like different stories between either the, the foreign VCs with the government or the entrepreneurs uh, with governments. So like it's actually not that nice. There are like some nasty stories. So I just want to get your point of view on like. Well, those nasty stories are other people, of course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, what what? So if I led people to think that we have special relationships, th that's not the case. Um, the relationships, uh, I mean, again, not to be politically correct, I mean, you, you, you know, in China there's a big problem, of course, still with who you know 
and who you're related to and how you can get things done. We have never been one of those firms that depended on those quote unquote relationship deals. Okay? So that's one type of relationship, right? The son of the ex prime minister, you know, whatever the case may be, right? We don't like those deals. And in fact, deals that had some kind of special relationship or some license at all, most of them have not turned out very well. So the relationships where we've actually built a good, just like you would with a, a, uh, a, a, a government in terms of bringing jobs into an area and they provide you, you know, t you know tax holidays and things like that or, or land in order to do that. I mean, those deals have worked out really well because we have the same mutual interest. And, and I'd say our government relations on that measured by that scale are, are, are very, very good. Um, the provinces are very anxious, especially some of the second tier provinces, to bring technology and jobs into their areas, into certain areas, and they've targeted certain areas. So for example, we've started a healthcare initiative. There, you know, there, there are many science parks that are very focused on healthcare and biotech and biopharma. You know, um, there are some that are focused on solar, some are focused on LEDs, some are focused on battery technology, and we've had, enjoyed really great relationships with those. Um, of course they can go wrong, you know. Luckily, we weren't in Chongqing, for example, and you know, at the wrong time. But uh, um, go ahead, you were next. China, that's like law or content is not that good. It's not that good, and we know that in Zhongguanzun district, we will have some uh, organization like Innovation Works. They will give some law and uh, or content support. So uh, what do you think is, uh, what do you think uh, the differences between the VC and the traditional VC and this kind of organization? You mean like specifically innovation works model, for example? Um, or? I, uh, for example, that uh, if we want to have VIE structure, and you know there are so many terms actually that is very difficult <coughs> to understand. Yes. And also uh, for a company at a very early stage, it's very hard for them to hire very professional yes. people uh, to read. Yes. Yeah, so how to solve those problems? So, so just to <coughs> expand on the question, as I, I understand it, so other people can, can follow. Um, um, in order to get foreign money into a Chinese company, meaning US dollars, um, these VIE structures were set up, which are very complex, take very professional people to set up. You have to get permission from the, uh, uh, the, the Chinese Finance Commission, for, for lack of a better, a better name for them, in order to do this. And it's a very... Um, it's a tough process and actually makes it harder for, for, for startups to be very fluid if you have a structure like that. So I, I totally agree with you and I think that is the case. I talked about RMB based funds. If you have an RMB based fund where it's RMB dollars that you're investing, it eliminates a lot of those issues. However, it provides tougher problems on the back end when you get to be successful because RMB based investments have to go public on domestic exchanges. This all has to do with the Currency, foreign currency exchange controls that the Chinese government has. I personally believe that in the next 10 years, I wish I could be more accurate, and I think it's personally shorter than that, those, those issues will go away, you know, because it's, it'll be beneficial. I mean, the Chinese government has had very good reasons, God, I don't want to become political again too, about having foreign currency exchange controls. Um, in this particular, you know, it has a much bigger backdrop of why it's there. In this small area of startups and things like that, it, it is a big problem, and I think that's going to be taken care of over time. We are very good at setting up the, the VIE structures, so it's not, you know, um, we do that as part of our services and stuff like that as well. So we okay. can. Very fast. Excellent. I saw your hand. Sorry. So you mentioned that your company in West was at 50 companies. So I'm wondering, so how many companies are biotech related? And where is Today, one. We just started. And today is only one. After two years of setting up, this practice, there's only one. And it's not a biotech, it's a medical device company. Oh, medical device company. Yeah, but we, we are interested in, in, in biotech and biopharma companies. So, so where are the uh, VC-backed companies located? Mainly on Beijing, Shanghai, or just? So um, our first one is actually, um, we, we have a model also too where we invest in US technology to bring over to China. So our first one actually is US technology that we want to bring into China. Um, and biopharma companies, that will also probably be an example where we'll do that as well. We're looking at one biopharma company that's based in Silicon Valley, but its market is probably 100% in, uh, in China. <laughs>
due to many fact uh, due to many factors. I mean, it couldn't be more targeted on it because it's only for Han Chinese. <laughs> One of the um, you know apparent strengths of Silicon Valley has been that we have a lot of people from everywhere who live here. And one of the patterns that I've seen over the last 10 or 15 years are people who grew up in China and they went to school here and they worked here for a while and then they want to go back and, and start something in China again. you have any special advice for them? Well, that's why we have a Silicon Valley Palo Alto office is because, the, I mean, our, our, our initial model eight years ago was to take advantage of those, those, those people. Yeah. And actually what we found out, it's kind of interesting. For people that have been away from China too long, like 15 or 20 years, they go back in China, they may have family there, but they don't have the networks of, of, um, of tech workers the that they would have. Current right, right, networks. Current, current yeah. networks, right. Um, so that takes a little bit of adjustment. Then there's the people that are here for four years for the PhD program and then go back and are very current. We, I mean, we love, we, we love Bill Tides and we can facilitate that. I don't know if you, you realize too, but that government, Chinese government actually has, or Beijing provincial city government actually has money <laughs> that they will give you to relocate back to China if you've come from China originally. I mean, so there's lots of easy ways for people to do that, and, and we can be very uh, useful in helping people get back. Okay, go ahead. As we know that uh, in recent months, the, China, uh, the Chinese economy is uh, slowing down. <coughs> and some will even say that the year of high-speed growth is over. And uh, it, it, it seems that uh, the, the government, the central government, needs need to pro, uh, uh, pro, provide, high, provide high some uh, state-owned sectors like the SOE, like China Mobile, as you mentioned. So in your perspective, where this happen? And if this happen, what will be the impact for the uh, and we see? Well, I think China, like any other large country and prosperous country, has, ma has many issues. Um, I've, I've, I have many things to complain about the Chinese government as I have to complain about the U.S. government. It's just hard. <laughs> Um, and nobody likes the government in power, but you know, actually, it, it, in China, it's it's. Um, I guess it's the predictability and the stability actually that is actually, I think, better than in the U.S. And um, even with the change in leadership, there is everybody has that little bit of uh, of, of uh, concern about what's actually going to happen once the the new leaders are in place. But then you, you know, but then it happens and you, things get back to normal. Uh, in terms of the actual economy itself, I think the Chinese economy is doing quite well. They have some major problems ahead of them, um, concern about f inflation and, and, and wealth distribution and, and things like that and, and jobs just in general. But um, I don't see the priorities with this new administration changing. I do like the new leadership is focusing a lot on, on cleaning up government. Um, I mean, I, I don't know if people have seen it. One of the major things in Beijing is there's a lot of military license plates on car on vehicles that al allow special privilege for those people. Well, the the central government has decided now that the that the military vehicles are all getting new license plates. So everybody had old ones that had were taking advantage of privileges when they couldn't, you know, are going to be left in the lurch and stuff like that. So I mean, whether you call that symbolic or not, actually, I don't think it's that symbolic. I think it's pretty <laughs> pretty real. But I think. I think the, the, the new leadership is focused on, on doing some things right. I don't think there's going to be a lot of changes to SOEs in the near future, though, to that specific points. Last question. Do you see, from the purely business standpoint, a changing role for Hong Kong or Taiwan or Singapore that have been kind of jumping off places to China? So let's see. Um, like they're not going to be needed anymore? So, tai, tai, okay. so yeah, no, well, no, no, no. I think, so first of all, Taiwan provides a lot of tech management expertise in China. Yeah. And there's a lot of uh, Taiwanese management expertise that's, that's in China. It's been there for 20 years or more. So I think that's going to continue. Um, as long as the relationships between Taiwan and China are the way they are now, there's been some minor bumps, it's great. I could live with that status quo for a long time. Um, the question is, with, will China want to increase that? I, 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 can't say, I can't say that. I don't know. Well, and I'm really sticking to the business yeah, relationship. Yeah, yeah, and, and side. Well, no, that's going to affect yeah. the business side of relationship well, too, yeah, right? Well, yeah, okay. So, so it's just, as far as Hong Kong goes, Hong Kong, I think, is a gem that China recognizes, but it's a gem with a pro some problems, right? The, the problems, so first of all, as a financial center, I think the Chinese government loves Hong Kong as a financial center. Unfortunately, if that includes money laundering, that's terrible, right? No, 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 seriously, I mean, you know, whether it's, 
Hong Kong real estate or other things as well. Um, Singapore continues to be a great destination for Plan B for a lot of people. And so for people that don't know, Plan B is, I mean, China has not been stable for all that long. And the wealth that's been created there, people don't have the same feeling of stability that we have here in the US or in Europe. And people are always in the back of their mind thinking about their kids and the stability of and protection of their family and wealth. And so people that can afford it have a, have a plan B maybe, whether that's you know, their kids going to school here or being born here or having a citizen, moving their citizenship to China. Singapore is playing a big role in that right now. The same way that European and Eastern European wealth is flowing to Singapore because Switzerland's now not the best place in the world. So I, I'm not trying to make this a China US thing, but Singapore is becoming a haven for that. Mm -hmm. And okay. uh, so that it plays a big role as well. But Hong Kong is going to have a fantastic role in the future of China. Okay. I'm afraid that we're out of our regular time, but we've got some refreshments outside. Let me ask you to let's talk with our speaker outside, not in here, okay? So <laughs> Thank thanks you. very much again. Kevin, that Thank was you. great. Fantastic.